yeah, that it that there has to be some active work to change the brain. That's what we're trying to do for people that want to change. That's why it's called the change triangle. And um, yes, and it's so, so sad, right, to be for a child to be constantly yelled at that what she learned, what Sarah learned is that and, and what happens with our parents, we we then um, project onto the world. So if our parent didn't couldn't accept our own personhood being different, like unless she was perfectly matching her mother, mother because of her mother's trauma, couldn't tolerate the separateness and would have to you know yell at her to to be exactly the way she needed, and then Sarah from then on, saw every person as her mother, right? Because it's the lens from which she learns to see the world is that I have to be perfectly pleasing to everybody I meet or else I'm going to be yelled at. They're going to be angry and abandon me and leave me forever and I'll be all alone and overwhelmed. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. You are listening to Don't Be Afraid to Talk podcast with James. I believe if we are going to affect change, we must go back to the basic, which for me, in essence, is conversations. Talking and listening is key for growth, and I hope our stories will bring us together and we can draw inspiration from each other. Conversation will include topics such as mental and physical health, trauma and its effect, suicidal thoughts, recovery, and well-being. We will continue to raise awareness and offer a different perspective, a mindset or an idea that could inspire you to take charge of your well-being and to grow as a human being. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Ask the Therapist. Today I'm joined by Hilary. Hilary is a psychotherapist, an author, a blogger and a speaker. (laughs) And Hilary is joining me from, are you in Connecticut? I'm in Connecticut. Sometimes New York City, once yeah. in a while, Florida. <laughs> okay, yeah, Hillary is joining me from Connecticut, sorry. And today we're going to be discussing emotions, amongst other things. Yes, yes, that's my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> if you're listening today, have an open mind, and we hope you can learn something from this episode. Hillary, how are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm delighted to be talking about my favorite subject. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, trying to kind of spread some of the the information and dis- disband misinformation that I got on emotions and that we all get and um, mm. try to, so we can all feel a little bit better. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Absolutely. I'm someone who's made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, what I mean by that is, I, uh, I've had a lot of failures in careers until I went back to social work school at the age of 39 to become a, a psychotherapist, which is something that I had always been interested in. Uh, I grew up with a very psychologically minded fa- mother and father. My dad was a psychiatrist and my mother was a guidance counselor. Um, mm. and, uh, I say I'm someone who's made a lot of mistakes because I'm on, on having a second marriage. I've been through, um, I wouldn't call this a mistake, but I'm someone who has been interested in mental health and is also, um, like really all of us, suffered and experienced depressions and anxiety, which I never knew until I studied emotions, how to sort of heal at the root. So. Mm. In a nutshell, though, my my bread and butter is I am a psychotherapist. I have a private practice. I work in a particular cutting edge method called AEDP, Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy. And I was also trained much more conventionally as a psychoanalyst. Mm. Um, 
and understanding cognitive behavioral therapy. But I really gravitated towards uh, a way of working with emotions in the body after I started reading and studying everything I could get my hands on um, to help people that came in that mm. I didn't have the proper tools to work with that um, turns out we're all kind of traumatized and we all need mm. uh, to mm. balance emotions. So I've, I then my sort of second career has just been creating resources and teaching kind of a grassroots effort to teach the public about emotions so that psychotherapies will change from a cognitive position to including the, the body uh, and emotions and that people have self-help tools like the change mm -hmm. trial, which I'm so passionate about sharing and which... Um, Penguin UK and Random House published a self-help book that I wrote called It's Not Always Depression, which is, if it's not always depression, what is it? It's <laughs> not paying attention to the truth of our feelings and trying to push those away, and it makes us ill. So mm. that's, what, that's what we're hopefully going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. feelings. <laughs> yeah. Never heard say, <laughs> Never Just, heard of them growing up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We don't talk about them. No, we live in an emotion phobic culture. Um, I, I did want to say about my background is that I was really quite. I was a, I was good at science always, and and good at school, and a science nerd, and the, and really understanding how to how to read scientific journals and papers. It really allowed me to embrace looking at emotions, which get such a bad rap less now, but as being, you know, as my father used to say, you know, that woo woo stuff, you know, we don't do that. We're like, yeah. we're intellectual and logical and mm. uh, that doesn't serve us so well, that type of a, of a rigid attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Like it can only move you so far and eventually you, <laughs> you have to find your way back. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. thank you for the podcast for having me and for sharing wisdom with, uh, with the world, with yeah, your heart. No efforts thank you thank you so before we get going we're going to play a quick game called one for one okay wait i give you a word <laughs> and yeah. you say the first word that comes to your mind okay so it's five random words and um, yes yeah, so you ready yeah what are you gonna yeah. do what are we doing something after or uh <laughs> yeah we have <laughs> my anxiety rise in my chest and i'm thinking <laughs> What am I feeling? No. A, little, a little nervous. <laughs> no, it's literally just five words. I will okay. give you a word at a time, and you say the first word that you, comes to your mind, and then we get going to the podcast. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, and uh, yes. Yeah, so the first one is sound. Music. Teddy bear. Cuddly. Repair. Fix. Temporary. Over. <laughs> You're thinking too much? <laughs> and yeah. the last one is roadmap. Compass. Yes, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I just like to start with that. <laughs> that's interesting. Do you ask all the guests <laughs> the same words? No, it's, okay. yeah, no, it's uh, different words all the time. Yeah, yeah. Just to kind of stress you out for a second. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, okay, I'm just going to have some drink. I'm going to get going. Yes, yeah, so my first question is, um, so the, the change triangle is something that you talk a lot in your book, which I love. <laughs> I love to read. Um, can you just tell us why you're passionate about that? Yeah. So I didn't invent anything new. What I um, what I seem to be good at is taking complicated scientific concepts and making them useful, easy to understand, and accessible, and useful in in everyday life. So when I saw this this triangle is an upside down triangle. For those listening, it may be a good idea just to do a quick Google search so you can see uh, it, this triangle and. Obviously, you know, emotions are a very dynamic thing and a triangle is a very simple two-dimensional representation. But when I first went to uh, an academic conference on emotions and trauma and attached mm. to the way people connect, and Diana Fosha, who 
developed this way of working called AEDP, who is an absolute brilliant and the most loving person. Um, uh, when when she developed AEDP uh, and spoke at this conference, the change triangle was really the map to show the way that emotions and the way we block them are and emotions and symptoms, which we can really think of like a symptom as um, as anxiety, as depression, as addiction, uh, as perfectionism, workaholism, all these things. These mm. are these are the ways that we block emotions. And so the change triangle is a is a dynamic tool that shows where we are in any given moment of the day, what state we're in. Are we in our core emotions, which I always point to my body because core emotions like anger and sadness and fear and disgust and joy and excitement and sexual excitement, right? These are wired in survival emotions that we need to pay attention to. They're, they're data. They tell mm. us how the environment is affecting us. But because we live in this dysfunctional society that is emotion phobic, we learn not to validate our emotions. We push them down and we move up the triangle, in this diagram, up into sort of anxiety and defenses, which are at either the top poles. Mm. And throughout the day, we can either identify us, uh, our, our state, our emotional state and mental state as blocking emotions yes. or as inhibiting emotions with anxiety, guilt, and shame, or as being able to be in touch with our core emotions and then on the very underneath the triangle is this state of the authentic self and it relates to when our mind and body feel integrated and balanced when we're paying attention to emotions and letting those move through us and thoughts and we feel our our best self our true our true self uh we feel connection we feel calm mm can access curiosity and um, and compassion. And so the, the change triangle is a tool that I use practically daily, and I have since I saw it back in 2004, to work with my emotions to get to a better place. Because wherever mm. you, once it's a step-by-step -step process to learning to recognize where you are and then what needs to be done to feel better. And mm. I just can't imagine my life without understanding emotions and without this tool anymore because uh, I feel it's an empowering thing to be able to uh, notice an emotion, name it, validate it, and then think through how to uh, take care of our needs um, and to communicate our emotions. And um, I mean, there's just so much in this simple representation, and that's why... Yeah. The book, as you know, tells a lot of stories to show exactly what it's like to work with emotions in this way. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because, and I will just say one more thing, and then I will let you speak. <laughs> no. The problem with emotions is that you cannot think your way through an emotion. You have to experience it. And when you're writing a book, how do you give somebody an experience? Um, because it's really a left brain intellectual thing to read a book. It's coming from that part of your brain. You have to share stories and the stories are very evocative and illustrative. Um, so that's why the book, while it's very easy to read and there's no jargon and I wanted 15 year olds and above to be able to have this basic education and emotions, um, uh, the stories really help bring this two dimensional lifeless diagram to life in a way that is meaningful. Mm, mm, yeah, I think reading a book, the stories did do that for me. <laughs> it I just kind of, <laughs> yeah, it kind of, uh, well, it made it real, as in, because you can relate from experience and you can relate from someone's story. Yeah. And with a triangle, uh, you can see each person where they were and the defense, what was protecting them. And how will they end up getting into their body? Because I don't think many of us don't know how to get into our body. <laughs> well, we don't. Exactly. And that's the sort of the teaching, the technique, is how do you make that very courageous shift from letting go of the safety of our mind to beginning to gently 
scan the body for emotion in the same way we recognize when we're hungry because we might feel our stomach is empty. Yeah. So we're, we're used to feeling our bodies. We know when we have to pee. We know when we want to throw up. We know when mm. we're hungry. We know when we're cut. So it's really just learning. And I think for most people, demystifying emotions so they're not as scary and overwhelming. Um, and uh, so mm. I do want to say for listeners that there's a one page description of the change triangle and tons of free resources. If you Google what is the change triangle, you'll find it all over the internet but i have uh, on my website which maybe you'll you'll share with people has a bunch mm. of resources and and smaller articles to demonstrate how to work with this with a variety of symptoms and um, life experiences yeah yeah because yeah. we can get caught up with because we're not used to feeling our emotions we can get caught up with inhibitory emotion feelings and identify that as the problem exactly you mean like if we just say well I'm anxious, like I used to say yeah. when I was, it's like, I'm anxious. And that's the end of the story. So what are my options? I can take a pill. I can do recreational drugs. I can exercise to death and keep trying to get rid of that anxiety. Mm. Or if we think the way I do now, that anxiety is a signal that there's underlying core emotions that are coming up being triggered or ignited by life experiences that we have to that i have to notice and pay attention to like i'm sad because somebody died or i lost mm. something that's important to me or i'm angry because somebody hurt me and insulted me or or rejected me or ignored me or i'm mm. disgusted because of somebody's toxic behavior that type of thing and then we can name the emotions and the anxiety will go down because that's how we're wired that um when we can name our experiences it yeah. calms on the whole nervous system very mm. useful. very useful and if you're going to practice this you need to be very patient with it that's it's, a lifelong practice yeah it's not something you just like okay this is how i feel because sitting in with emotion is <laughs> it's painful enough yeah. 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 The, the I, trick is to make it safe. So safer. So when we were little and we had overwhelming emotions and our parents didn't know what to do because nobody taught them about emotions, we're just left alone feeling overwhelmed. And then we learn, oh, emotions are bad. That was too much. I better learn how to push those away. But there's just so much we can learn, so many tips, techniques um, that that make because emotions are sort of logical and predictable like we know for example if somebody dies we're wired to feel mm. loss especially and, and the more connected we were to them the more mm. sadness we'll feel so there's a certain predictability about not only what emotions we have at what times but what they what they feel like in the body and we can just like when you do something new it's it's scary and uncomfortable and the more you do it the more comfortable it gets so but i'm i'm really glad that you mentioned that it's this is not a quick fix this is about yeah. healing, healing at the root and a and a practice it's like mindfulness with a map in a way so mm. we're practicing noticing we're practicing self compassion and we're setting the stage by slowing down and learning how to breathe to regulate emotions so that we can begin to touch these phenomena, phenomena that are just human experiences that we can build our capacity to tolerate as opposed to bury, which causes, you know, bearing emotions is exactly what causes chronic anxiety, depression, um, all sorts of, you know, stomach problems, heart problems, stress. Mm. I just read mm. uh, when the, um, a book by Gabor Mate called um, "When the, the What is the name of the Here it is. When the body says no. When the body says no. I, yeah. I, I I loved it. It was fascinating, you know, scientifically about emotions are connected to the nervous system, which are connected to the immune system, which are connected to hormones, and it's all a feedback loop. And when we suppress emotions, it just puts stress on the mind and body, and we can become quite ill mm. and the process is re reversible and the change triangle really is the guide uh to what mm. needs to be done 
Yeah, just before I go into my next question, it's something you said I want to pick up on. Say loss, for example, where a child loses a family member, for, for example, and obviously you're meant to feel sad. That's what you'd feel. That's but if, you, if, if, you, if that sadness is not permitted or it's played down, those emotion just stays there. And when you get to adult life, <laughs> they start finding a way out. And it's that way we can get caught with our inhibitory feelings instead of being like, okay, I'm feeling that because I haven't processed what happened 20, 15 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Difficult, yeah. difficult. Mm. Yeah. But I have to say, you know, I so relate even to that example. Growing up, uh, we didn't do sadness in, in my family. Um, everything, my mom was, was, a, was, a, was a really good mom and she was empathic and compassionate, but her, her blind spot, she didn't, you know, in her family, they didn't do sadness. So when I was sad, it was more about cheering me up. Mm. And that was l lovely. But as a result, because there was no space or modeling or experience, even to say, you know, that makes it like I, I think back to when my dog died when I was 10 or 11. And um, and there was no sort of space for it's so sad. You know, it would have been a great teaching moment because it wasn't so catastrophic. It, I mean, I love my dog and dogs are very important. but you know, to say, um, yeah, it's so sad. I know you're going to miss Beji and, and, you know, it's okay to feel sad. And it, as long as it takes, you're going to feel better eventually and hugs and snuggles. And what do you mean? Um, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And as opposed to not making a space for the sadness and what happened as a result of my upbringing and not being able to bring up sadness because my mom didn't really like it, I guess is like the simple way to say it. She didn't, it's not what I, I knew she wanted. I then pushed down the sadness. And then what happens is all I could notice is anxiety. So for my whole life, until I saw the change triangle, anytime someone died, I heard of someone dying, or I had to go to a funeral, or I had to, to write a letter, I was riddled with anxiety. When I, that's another reason I love this triangle, because once I saw sadness underneath anxiety, I was like, first of all, you mean it's OK to like validate and be with sadness? You would think mm -hmm. I would know that, but these messages are, run so deep in families that it sounds silly to not know that I could name and be with sadness. But the truth is, my nervous system didn't have a space for it. And now... I don't have that anxiety anymore. When when something sad happens, I can feel sad because I practice building yeah. my capacity to relearn how to feel my sadness. And mm. uh, that looks different depending on what's what my circumstances are. Yeah. But but if the goal is to reduce anxiety, it's much better to feel the sadness, which will pass because all core emotions when they're in their pure form, they come up like a wave and then they settle down. And over time, when there's a loss, we feel better. But if we're just anxious, everything is kind of locked into place. We're pushing that sadness down and we're just, the anxiety just travels with us until we learn to let all that emotional mm. energy flow and not energy in the woo woo sense that my dad. <laughs> yeah, it's like what's all right? Yeah. But real physiological energy because emotions have impulses and they affect every organ in the body because the purpose of a core emotion is to really make us move in ways that are adaptive, like to run from danger or to cry when sad um, or to fight or set boundaries when, mm. when we're angry and when something doesn't feel right. Um, mm. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that. Mm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. My next question is, what are inhibitory emotions? So inhibitory emotions, which are on the top right corner of the change triangle, right? Because mm. they, because we feel them with the emotions underneath. There's the inhibitory emotions are there to 
and to they well what their purpose is well first let me name them there are three different types of inhibitory emotions and they each work and come up in their own way depending on the person and the situation anxiety which we feel when we push down core emotions shame which in small amounts is healthy cuz shame is again an evolutionarily uh designed emotion to keep humans connected because when we function well in groups we have better survival chances mm. um so it's sort of very primitive that so the the shame tells us when we are are bad in terms of like if i get angry and i kill you that's bad and if i'm not a sociopath i'm going to feel shame at even the thought of doing that and so yeah. shame will will prevent us in doing whatever we want based on our emotional impulses right too bad we don't have more shame in our leaders who mm. want to yeah, create that's... Power, right so <laughs> Uh, that we really that you people need small doses of shame. We use shame to teach children. Uh, you can't run around naked. You can't uh, pee in public. That's that's not okay. And so we children learn that way. So it's a great mm. learn. The problem is that our society and families often shame us for aspects of who we are. They sh we get shamed for the color of our skin. We get shamed for our sexual identification. We get shamed for what we're good at and what we like. Like if I'm terrible at sports in an athletic family, I'm going to feel shame for my mm. anatomy. So shame can bind to any emotion. So I can feel ashamed for feeling good about myself. I can feel ashamed for feeling frightened, which is what our society does to men. You're weak if you are frightened. You're weak if you're sad. So what wires in the brain and body is shame connects to these emotions. And as soon as we start to feel them naturally, the shame is the inhibitor. It pushes mm. us down and it, we retreat like a turtle shell. We get a message. Yeah. It's conscious. And then guilt is the other inhibitory emotion, right? Shame is when we feel that there's something wrong with us. And guilt is when we feel our, what we've done is bad. So guilt mm -hmm. is for a bad deed and shame is a feeling that there's something wrong with our personhood. And guilt, again, in, in appropriate bounds, we want to feel guilty when we do something bad, but we don't want to be, we don't want to teach our children and we want to heal from the guilt of when we're just taking care of ourselves. Like saying, no, I, I don't want to go to, uh, I can't meet you for lunch because I'm mm -hmm. tired. Right. And I have to take care of myself or I don't feel well today or saying no to a boss that you've given me too much work. I want to get it done. But, you know, I have to tell you that I'm I if I stay up 12 hours getting this work done, I, I may not be good the next day at the office. So mm. being able to to communicate our needs and without feeling so guilty that we the experience is intolerable and we just kind of stay to ourselves in this kind of state of chronic aloneness and guilt. Mm, yeah. Because people are guilty just for existing when other people in their family have died, like in war or in, you know, genocide. Mm. Yeah, yeah, guilt so is, it's, yeah. well, both are very excruciating. They're all, yeah. all inhibitory emotions. Um, in large amounts feel awful and too many of them mixed with too many emotions will shift us over to the defense corner of the change triangle so that we are not so overwhelmed that we feel like we're going to go crazy or that we have to kill mm. ourselves. We thank God we, our brain, mind and body can develop these creative ways to spare us intense emotional pain. Like, even getting depressed is like a massive shutdown. So depression is a defense, be but against all these feelings that have to be processed. Um, mm, mm. It's a mood state that shuts us down um, and that often gets healed as we make room for the underlying emotions or addictions, the same thing, or any of the defenses. And I have a whole list of defenses 
you know, in the book and on my website too, that people can access in the toolbox. To give you an example, yeah. there's so many, there's big defenses and there's kind of in the moment defenses like dropping eye contact or just walking away or blaming is a defense, judgments are defenses, not opinions, but like when you just judge something before you get to know it or understand it, these are mm. ways to spare us emotional pain and conflict. It obscures the underlying emotions. Mm -hmm. I have some defenses here I want to go through. Um, okay. I'm just going to go back on something you said. <laughs> so, when you, I'm going to use depression. So as a defense, so a, a part of you that gets depressed, even though it's not healthy for you, its job is only to protect you. So in one hand, it's trying to protect you. Yes. Without knowing that it's damaging you. Yes. Is that because your brain just created a part to avoid a, like say anger, for example? Mm-hmm. So yes. we get we get caught with that depression <laughs> because we because the brain doesn't want to feel the anger so and it's too much it stays in depression mode even though the depression is damaging damaging us so yes. you get caught up in a loop where you don't really know is that where we get stuck the most for example yeah I mean it's sometimes in well. Absolutely. Everything you said is, is right. Uh, it's, it's a, in a simplified version, um, <laughs> that, uh, and it's important to sort of know the basics and then we can bring in more like complication, but yes, uh, because if we have learned that being angry will, and these, these messages and learnings which started in childhood. So let's say we've learned that if we show anger to our mother, let's say starting at like 18 months or two years, we start, you know, I don't know if you've seen infants if you're around, but when they get angry, yeah. you know, they, they scream and their lips <laughs> quiver. And if a mother then withdraws and doesn't like that, right? Because of her own, the intergenerational trauma where there's no tolerance of, of that type of emotion, no understanding like, oh, my baby's angry. What do they need? Um, mm. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they need their diaper change, something like that. Um, if the mother withdraws, that is so threatening to the child's and baby's well-being because more than we need to feel our emotions, we need our caregivers close to us to feed and comfort, provide shelter and safety. Again, these are these are wired in. These are just how humans are. Mm -hmm. Connection trumps everything. So we learn that anger is not okay, and as we go through life, we keep kind of trying to get around feeling angry. We feel guilty instead. Um, we feel ashamed instead. We call ourselves an angry person. We become perfectionistic. But all of a sudden, the anger builds up, and it's just too much to hold down. And then we get a, a whopping depression that's pushing that down where everything, the, the mind just figures out. It, it's not as if it's like a thought out concept. It's just yeah. what happens with the stress on the nervous system, the stress on the nervous system from pushing down the emotion, the science will say, will decrease the amount of serotonin and other neurotransmitters that the brain is making. Because to, to do what we need to do, the body needs to be healthy emotionally and physically, and it's all connected. So I stop making serotonin as mm. much as I need to do. And then I start to develop symptoms of depression. I can't sleep or I sleep all the time. I don't feel like doing anything. I can barely get dressed and take a shower. My appetite changes. And now all of a sudden we've, we're in this depressed state. What do we do? And that happened to me twice. I went, I went through two major depressions um, from stress. I didn't know about emotions. This was before I had ever seen the change. Mm. Trying. My sister said, you mm. seem to and I was like, oh, yeah, because sometimes we don't even know we're in a defense. It's it's like it's like we just are in it. We don't we can't see ourselves. It's much easier for other pe for us to see other people and for other people to see us than for all of us to see ourselves. Yeah. You know, awareness is the toughest part of the change. Mm. Trying, if you ask me, especially if people are locked in defenses.
But my sister said, you know, you seem depressed. And I was like, oh, yeah, I think I'm depressed. I went to a psychologist. <laughs> they gave me Prozac. I took Prozac for six months, which raises the serotonin level so I could function again. And, um, and then it happened one more time. Once I saw the change triangle and I started to validate my emotions and, and experience them, I hadn't had a depression since then. So, um, and in there it wasn't buried anger mm. necessarily. I was, it was fear um, because of big changes in my life, like getting divorced and my husband getting, my former husband getting remarried and really feeling alone in the world and um, those mm. types. Mm. So it's for everybody. And that's just one of many, one of many symptoms slash defenses. The, the mind is genius in the way we can create all these different ways of avoiding emotions so that we can go on with oh, life. Yeah. 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 As fascinating thing <laughs> that it can do. It really is. It really is. It really is. And yes, thank you for that. Um, my next question was, yes, sorry, this is from the book. I wanted to, because I really enjoyed the stories of the book and it just helped make it simpler for me to understand. So there's two, two stories I picked up. Well, there's more than two stories. I just picked up two. <laughs> so Sarah's depression. So Sarah, she is the girl that grew up with abusive mother. Verbal. And as a result of that, she became... Verbally abusive, sorry, yeah, verbally abusive, yeah. No, I just want to clarify as that a, as because a, verbal abuse is a real thing. When our parents yell at us and are mean to us, call us names, that's abuse. It's verbal abuse, and often it's more damaging or as damaging as physical and abuse, which has scars. So people like actually feel sorry for you, but with verbal abuse, you know, I, I get told mm. by people all the time, they feel like they're just whining and complaining, and no. The, yeah want to be treated nicely that's what makes us feel good yeah we saw the verbal abuse where people are just moaning or complaining (laughs) so it becomes more tolerable as in like you just put up with it because like oh what are you moaning for they only said this but as a child and like for sarah's case at the time she was just kind of taking all that stuff in all the verbal abuse and she developed defenses and one of them was perfectionism Mm-hmm. And she's over obsessive, over, over obsessive, sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like head banging and things like that. And you mentioned that when she started therapy, she was kind of, well, she was afraid uh, to show a lot of emotions and she was afraid to assert herself because she just associated because in her childhood, she couldn't assert herself because it was all, she couldn't do any r- r- right, if you like. So for her, from, from, from what I've read is that, so if she didn't start therapy, for example, that just would have been the cycle she would have carried on. Right. And do you think without therapy, she would have repeated that cycle? Because often we tend to repeat what happens to us when we don't know what's happening. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 That it, that there has to be some active work to change the brain. That's what we're trying to do for people that mm. want to change. That's why it's called the change triangle. And um, yes. And it's so, so sad, right. To be for a child to be constantly yelled at that what she learned, what Sarah learned is that, and, and what happens with our parents, we, we then um, project onto the world. So if our parent didn't, couldn't accept our own personhood being different, like unless she was perfectly matching her mother, mm. her mother because of her mother's trauma, couldn't tolerate the separateness and would have to, you know, yell at her to, to be exactly the way she needed. Mm. And then Sarah, from then on, saw every person as her mother, right? Because it's the lens from which she learns to see the world is that I have to be perfectly pleasing to everybody I meet 
or else I'm going to be yelled at. They're going to be angry and abandon me and leave me forever. And I'll be all alone and overwhelmed. Mm. So what our job was to loosen the grip. Now, trauma from day one like this is, is hard to change because mm. it is so deeply wired. These beliefs about the self and others. Um, but I can tell you that just working with thoughts is not enough. We need the closer we get to healing is the closer we get to the body and being with the emotions in the body. So we would talk a lot about what was happening between us. And she would think that I was mad with her all the yes. time. And I knew I wasn't mad because I'm pretty in touch having all the therapy that I've had and <laughs> studying and working with emotions for almost 20 years now that, um, I could in good conscience know that I wasn't angry and that it was all a projection. And then we could sort of separate, you know, I would say something like I, I would put up a, like a blank sheet of paper. I'm looking for one to sort of <laughs> emulate what I would do. Oh, well, so I would say, who am I right now? Because I know it's not me being angry at you. And so she could see the projection a little bit better. You know, it's, and she would say, yeah, it's my mom. And then I would say, you know, if we get your, if we try to, if you, we get your mom out of our, out of the room, so it's just the two of us, what do you see in my face? What, what do you feel in my body posture? Could she try to see the reality in the moment? And mm. then the emotions that came up, both, you know, then what is it like that your mother made you feel? feel this way, trying to process the anger at her mother, like trying to find herself and her feelings outwards, not just the self-consciousness about how she's being seen. Yeah. So that, that was probably the most complex story that I, that I showed because it's about the attachment relationship, which is also all part of understanding ourselves, however, mm -hmm. with our parents were what went right, what went wrong. And, um, yeah, yeah, because I think as a child, she was trying to attach to a mother that was never there. And I think her father just kind of knew about it, but just passive, <laughs> just didn't so really was, do anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he was scared of the mother too. You don't yeah. want, you want to the peace, you don't want to ignite the wrath, so everybody walks on eggshells. Mm. But it really leaves the, the children alone with mm. all the emotions, because when... When your mother yells at you or anybody yells at us, just imagine when someone yells at you, it ignites uh, fear, it ignites anger, um, mm. it ignites sadness. You know, why I'm, you know, I'm sad for the loss of the connection and the, and the loss of someone feeling good about me. And each one of those emotions individually have to, has to be named, right? So we have to hold multiple emotions often in one little body. So I often say to people, just imagine you grow bigger so that you can have each of these emotions separated by lots of air and space in between. <laughs> and then we go through one emotion at a time and try to name it, notice it in the body, mm. locate the impulse that every emotion, every core emotion has. What's the impulse of anger is I want to punch my mother in the nose. And then, so how do we release that angry energy? We can use fantasy. Can you imagine, right? Not as a dress rehearsal because we don't yeah. hurt other people and we don't let other people hurt us. That's sort of the general rule here. But we can use fantasy and the brain doesn't know the difference. So fantasy is a great way to release um, lots of emotions, but most especially anger. But mm. we can do things like pushing on a wall to set a boundary, ripping paper. There's lots of tips and techniques. And sometimes it's just a lot of trial and error to see where you get that release mm. feeling inside. And you recognize it. Once we get used to staying in the body and using that as our sort of compass to what feels good, what doesn't feel good, where's the pressure, where's the anxiety, mm. kind of get good at using our body as the sort of key um, just the key indicator along with yeah. our logical thoughts of what's going on. But the body doesn't lie, and it's the archive no. of our history. Yeah. <laughs> no, it all stays there. I think with anger, there's, there's a story, I think it's Bonnie's Rage, where she had the, Bonnie had an issue with her father, and like that, she was able to use her mind to stand up to her father. 
So when you're working with something like this, especially anger, you don't necessarily have to like call the person and address the person. <laughs> you can just right. do it in your mind. Right. Yeah. And, and that takes some thought process too. Like oftentimes it is helpful, especially if you're living with someone, you have to kind of set limits and boundaries. So you have to confront, but we can, we can learn so much. Again, this stuff isn't taught to us in high school and it really should be about how to set limits and boundaries in a way where you can be heard. So you start with kindness, right? I love you. And I'm really angry that you <laughs> yeah. called me stupid. I don't want you to talk to me that way again. And I love you. And I, do you hear me? And I, and I forgive you if you can promise me that you'll be aware of that. Then if somebody gets defensive and makes it all about them or doesn't listen, you're going to have to come back with a little more force. Hey, you're not hearing me. Dude, I don't want you to call me names. Can you say back to me what you just heard? And that's mm. something that you need to work on. That type of thing. That's, so that's sort of an example of handling it interpersonally. Um, sometimes we don't want to go back to our parents. They're old and frail, and we just want to process childhood trauma with somebody else. And that's where we can use the fantasy. So we go back to the memory, and we imagine what we want to do or say. Yes. And if there's a lot of abuse, sometimes it goes beyond words, that the, the physical impulse of the anger, right, which is, I really like helping people with anger because it's, it's one of the main emotions that we all struggle with. Mm. And it's mm most important emotions to be able to not hold in so we don't become ill um that we can the more abuse or neglect that we suffered the more physical the angry impulse that the perpetrator will be so it may be that we will feel in our throat the anger coming up and i'll say okay if that anger could talk what does it want to say but sometimes people are talking and I see their fists, right? We're, in this work of AEDP, I'm looking at um, mm. the nonverbal, the body a lot. So someone will be making a, mis a fist and I'll say, what do your fists want to do to your poor mothers? We get the bad, bad to your mother. <laughs> it's often the mother and the father or the, the sibling. <laughs> what do your fists want to do? And you sort of de-shame and detoxify the idea of allowing the fantasy because fantasy is a very safe way to discharge anger. Nobody gets hurt. Although people mm. will say, I don't feel right hitting my mom. And I'll say, yeah. well, is your mom here? And they'll look around and they'll <laughs> go, no. I'm like, no, it's, it's a fantasy. Your mom is in her house. She's totally fine. She has no idea what we're doing. This is for you. This is for you so that you don't have to carry this burden inside you. And then no. often will get into murderous rage portrayals is what we call them in ADP where they'll mm. really just take it to the end and let it out yeah and they'll feel sadness at the end often the love can flow in afterwards I mean there's a lot to this emotion stuff it's very rich it's very deep and it's so human and we all experience emotions in basically the same way according to the rules you know the way mm. the change angle works it's universal across cultures yeah yeah anger is a very <laughs> it's a very interesting emotion it can yeah yes i teach an anger i'm teaching an anger workshop soon i think on april 14th through the aedp institute for for licensed professionals but i think i'll do one for the general public soon mm because mm, that's just before i go on to my next question so i'm going yeah. off the <laughs> going off the rail here yeah great. because like and uh, yeah. With anger, if you don't express it, it just stays in your body. Like you just kind of get stiffed up and things like that. Right. And muscular tension, stomach aches, right? Headaches. Yeah. yeah. Depressed. Anxious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like as an adult, you can, what well, you don't know is anger, unless you're familiar with it, you probably just think something is wrong. But it must be difficult for a child where the, not happy they're trying to express the anger express how they feel and you have these parents that's like shutting you down it's like if you express like who you're talking to type of thing so you kind of go back in your shell again exactly and you just have this 
emotions in your body that you carry around you don't exactly. you don't, you don't have a conscious awareness of it until until you, the you, symptoms yeah yeah until it start getting physical but even at that time you still don't know it's anger <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah exactly okay. and that's why i'm so passionate that this should be taught in high school you know you get a basic education in in biology in high school we know we have a stomach and an esophagus and a pancreas but emotions affect us every day it would be so nice for people all of us to know that emotions are normal and natural and that to know the difference mm. between a core emotion and an inhibitory emotion and a few tips on how to name them and identify them but really de-shaming and demystifying the whole concept of emotions and slowly the culture is changing but it's not fast enough because we no. have a mental health crisis on our hand no and yeah I, yeah i used to feel ashamed for my emotions i used to feel weak when i had emotions and i thought i was bad for being angry and then when i learned all this it was a breath of fresh air i didn't even practice the change triangle yet just knowing intellectually that emotions were uh natural programs and that they weren't something I was supposed to get rid of, nor could I, because yeah. the bottom line is we can't stop emotions from happening. They're just hardwired in the middle of the brain. And then they, then they affect the body even before we know we've had them. Mm. All we can change is our response to an emotion. We can block it, which isn't good for us, or we can validate it. And if all someone learns to do is to be able to say, you know what, I'm angry and like be able to not guilt themselves or shame themselves for that that's going to help their health quite a bit mm, mm, totally yeah just so yeah so i'll go on to my next question <laughs> i had yeah. another one on what we're talking about okay. i'll move on i'll move on to my next one so right. <laughs> um what role does neuroscience and neuroplasticity oh trouble pronouncing this word you got it exactly right N neuroscience and neuroplasticity play in trauma with neural networks. So this is reprogramming your brain. Yes. So Yeah, so like, yeah, so role, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what role like how does that work? That yeah. process. Yeah. So let me use my little model of a <laughs> brain here which um uh Why is that? <laughs> this, okay, so this is a lemon squeezer. And it is surrounded by lots of pipe cleaners. But really what we're representing as a metaphor is the lemon squeezer is the brain and the body of the authentic self, right? We mm. all have an authentic self. It's how we were born before we started to get shaped by society and family's messages. So when something bad, ha so here's all the, the neural networks, right? And just for people listening, neuro neuroscience and is refers to the science of of uh, of the nervous system, and neuroplasticity refers to brain change. Right when we say that we have neuroplasticity, it's really how we learn. Right, so we learn something, and now we have a new uh, a neuron is connected to another neuron, and all of a sudden mm. we know that two plus two equals four, and that kind of stays connected. Uh, and so this is like we could call neuroplasticity learning also, but it's also with trauma. We are wired in our experience. So the moment we are born, we and babies, we used to think babies had like nothing going on. They have yeah. so much going on and they're, they're wiring constantly with everything going on. And they're highly emotional beings because it's emotions really and, and the connection to the the emotional connection with the parent that is so crucial for survival. So let's say again, we have this baby that, um, uh, or let's say now a, a, a little two-year-old and she gets angry at mommy and then, uh, mommy, I hate you, right? Which kids say all the time because they're yeah. experimenting. You know, parenting tip number one, don't get upset when your kid says they hate you. They're just angry about something. So let's say I'm a kid and I say I'm angry and my mother says, don't you ever say that to me and look at the expression on my face. Look how scary that is. Like, so that scares the daylights out of a kid. Their, their neurons, <laughs> mm. <laughs> now we have a, a, a neural network that wires together. I have anger, which is now bound to shame and to the memory of my mother's face. 
and to where I was because it it registers in the brain as something very important. That felt so bad getting angry and having my mother get angry back that I'm not going to get angry at her again. I'm not going to show her I'm angry. And so we have this memory network that links and wires together. Okay, so now we used to have this beautiful, open, integrated, because we, we want sort of an integrated network where everything is kind of connecting up and we can um, have a feeling, have a thought, have yeah. a sense of self and know that it's all separate. Okay, so now we get triggered. Now I'm, um, let's say I'm living with my partner and I want to tell my partner that I'm angry about something and I get that same look that reminds me of my mother like the entire memory network kind of covers up the authentic self and now i feel like i'm two again and i'm terrified of my partner mm. so that's trauma right so we have an event and the event gets triggered out in life and it kind of lights up this neural network like a christmas tree and i go my authentic self hides because i'm um, I don't want anything bad to happen to me. And now I'm leading with defenses and shame and it's just not good. I can't communicate. I can't think. Um, mm. I feel connected. I feel alone. And the goal, what the change triangle teaches us is in this state, we have to be able to know that we are triggered into a defense. We're triggered into the past because mm. it's a familiar feeling, right? And this, yeah. this happens through therapy or through all sorts of self coaching and or reading and you know people can work this on their own sometimes they have uh, sometimes they can't and they have to go to a therapist depending on how much trauma yeah but then once we start to to find our authentic self and name the emotions we get a little more space and then we can try to process the memory like i said about you know what was it like to you know now when you think about your mother being so hard on you when you were a kid what emotions come up towards your mother right now Mm. I'm angry at her. Great. How do you know? How do you feel that anger in your body? I feel this energy coming up and out. Okay, well, what's your fist want to do? I want to knock her out. Okay, can you imagine that? And then we stay with that until all the, the angry energy is up and out. And meanwhile, this neural network now starts to uncouple mm. and we feel more integrated again. And so then we might have other experiences but the the later in life but it's really the childhood experiences because we're so yeah. vulnerable and mm. because we don't have a lot of uh cortex that's available to modify emotions that's why kids and teenagers are so emotional when we get older we can handle emotions much better than when we're kids but often we don't realize that because when we're triggered we f we're triggered into young childhood states yes. back with parents or back with a bully or back with someone who hurt us and we have to be able to differentiate past and present and that's what trauma therapy helps to do mm. as well yeah like the, the adult brain um should they have the anger they should be able to navigate through that on the basis that they know what's happening otherwise the trigger would bring them back to that two-year-old that three-year-old yeah. Yeah. And they feel and, helpless. Yeah. Withdrawn, a powerless, crisis of confidence, um, unworthy of love, lots of old mm. feelings that aren't appropriate for the moment because really the, the, the adult in front of you is just like, uh, okay, I'm sorry I got angry. That's <laughs> my stuff. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry I got angry and insecure when you got angry and I couldn't hear you. You know, that that's the kind of adult conversations and that's my stuff and this is your stuff. And how can we sort of understand each other mm. and and go from there and figure out how to. Yeah, you, you see that in adult argument, for example, where both are triggered. No one's there in the other. Exactly. It happens and all we, the time. Yeah. And we're just stuck in blame. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And uh, someone who used to do that. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I just can't stress enough how we can all learn these things and it really makes a difference. Um, now, you know, with I, I don't have, I'm, I'm on a second marriage, 20 years, and it, 
this works because we both understand how to talk to each other. We both understand emotions, which allows us to cut each other slack, give us empathy, give each other empathy. And we have words to communicate our feelings and, mm. and the ability to tolerate each other's feelings. And that comes, it's a lifelong practice. And, it, you know, we, you keep practicing until you die. Yeah. But it feels really good to be, you see yourself making progress and communicating better and not getting triggered as much or as easily, not getting blown off course and um, builds confidence and a real solid sense of self. It's very mm. rewarding. Even becoming aware of it the first time, because um, this is not something you just like, oh, this is what I do, and you clean it up straight away. Like even becoming aware of it exactly. is a huge thing. Huge thing. Huge thing, and and uh, and hopefully the the a lot of what I write in the book and the blog and the classes that we teach the emotions education one hundred and one classes they're all it's not just lecturing it's it's mostly about giving someone an experience to recognize what's happening for them and once you do it once it's much easier to come back again mm. um, and uh, and to notice what's happening so it's like learning to play the piano practice yeah. practice. <laughs> we like learning things that we can actually that's physical and we can do and it's like i'm gonna go and do this but this involves you sitting down in your mind yeah. it's like yeah. oh no <laughs> exactly but i always say you don't have to practice any of this the first step is really the getting that proper emotions education which i mm. tried to do in it's not always depression just understand it and then if you feel like trying a couple of the exercises dip your toe in the water but even I think it's enough that we're not spreading down through the generations that emotions are something that they're not. They're just data. They're just how humans are wired. And if you know a little bit about them, there's no downside. No, no, yeah. definitely not. Great. Sorry, I have a couple of more questions. Sorry, <laughs> we went off the track there. Um, another thing I want to understand is psychological defenses fits in well with the change triangle and yeah. most of us get stuck on our defense. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I just had, I listed some of them here. I just wanted to ask you a quick, just to explain, summarize what each one of them is trying to do. Yeah. And um, so the first one I have is repression. Yeah. Yeah. So repression, that's the, is that the one that's happening unconsciously? Uh, yes. I mean, if you're looking at Freud and psychoanalytic thought, yes, repression is automatically bearing emotions. And why do we do that? To avoid feeling uncomfortable. Mm, mm. So a child that's not allowed to cry, brain learns, you can't cry, so I have to bury this, so I start repressing how I feel. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And okay. then again, if you're looking at the triangle, if you repress mm. how you feel... You start to go up the triangle to the inhibitory corner, and you may notice feeling more anxious. You may mm. have lower self-esteem because you're in shame or guilt, or you may just find yourself in a defense, which maybe you don't notice, but somebody else you live with notices first. Cause yeah, you always do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you're like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah, we never notice things. And uh, the second one is displacement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, you're, you're making me put on my psychoanalytic <laughs> now. It's been a long time. <laughs> we displace our feelings right onto somebody else. So let's see if we can give an example. Um, I'm really mad at my, uh, at my boss, but I take it out on my husband. I've displaced the feelings. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so my boss is, I'm upset with my boss, but I can't address my boss that way. So I go home and <laughs> take it out on someone else. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Great, I think, great. I think if you, if anyone's out there listening and it's not the correct, if you're a psychoanalyst and it's not the correct definition of displacement, you'll, you'll let us know. Yeah, I think that's how I understand as <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. And uh, the easier one is denial. Yeah. Yeah. This is not happening. This is not happening. <laughs> yeah. not happening, even though it's happening. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. We... Or I'm fine. I'm fine, right? The 
Uh, I'm fine. That's a great defense. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. No. That's probably yeah. one of the I, biggest defense we use. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> right. And uh, dissociation. Dissociation. Yeah. Dissociation is when we start to get into like trauma terms. It's really, if you envision these, these neural networks again, mm. let's say I'm aware, right? Here's my authentic self. I'm aware of these aspects of me and I'm aware of these memories. This memory over here, I'm not aware of because I've, I've dissociated it. It's too painful. My mind was going to, my mind and nervous system were so overwhelmed that I really thought I was going to lose my mind. I couldn't tolerate it. So it's as though it just goes into a compartment, mm. never to be found again, except if something triggers it, like, a, a, let's say, a, a somebody, let's say somebody was held up at gunpoint when they, uh, or witnessed some sort of a crime when they mm. were young. And uh, it was so scary. They were in so much terror that they dissociated it. Then I hear like a car backfiring and all of a sudden it lights up this network because it goes deeper than the dissociation. And now I'm just sitting in terror, but I have no idea. That's like in PTSD, mm. um, more veterans and victims of violence and rape that they will dissociate aspects. And then they're reliving them constantly, but they have no way of managing those feelings. And the work of trauma therapists, is, trauma therapy is to safely, right? So we don't have someone relive a trauma without, one, we may not have someone go into a trauma at all. We, there's many ways to, to work with it. But if we do, we want to make sure that we're not re-traumatizing, that there's, we're doing something different, like mm. making person is connected to us like the story of mario in the book when i um there was like a black hole feeling in inside yeah. Mario's chest and we 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 imagined that there was a tree rooted so that he could crawl into the hole yeah um, with, with me right there that's the difference between being alone in a trauma and knowing you have a, a quote older wiser compassionate empathic other to help through the experience. And again, mm. we're using fantasy and we're using memories and, um, and there's different components of experience that can be dissociated. An emotion can be dissociated, but, but the, the images can be dissociated. The body sensation can be dissociated, the impulse. So we have these part experiences that we don't know where they come from. They're not connected to a memory or a, or a narrative. And we mm. have to reintegrate the brain by making these gentle communications. Can you notice this feeling of terror in your body, but just around the edges so you don't get too overwhelmed? And can you keep me with you as you feel this, this trembling in your, mm. in your arms and legs that are a sign of fear processing through the body? That type of mm. thing. Yeah, it's a very... Painful one, painful one. And I just ask you two Very more. Um, a simple one, projection. So this is. Uh -huh. um, right. Like yeah. in Sarah, when she thought I was her mother. We yeah. are projecting all the time. When someone says, are you mad at me? I, <laughs> and I know I'm not. I'll be like, no. Is it possible you're mad at me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just a little bit of awareness. We project all the time based on, um, you know, for example, let's see if I can do a quick example. Um, I mean, geez. I mean, do you have an example of how you, how you project? Projection okay. of the, um, one I can think how I do it. I don't know. I don't even know if I do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all do so, it. Um, say, for example, in a relationship where one person's angry. Mm-hmm. Mm, and they're um sorry i'm gonna try use another example so say i don't know if this is projection but i'll try <laughs> yeah so the the wife goes to the husband you take the rubbish out and he said no he forgot to do it yeah 
And then she says, you're always forgetting to do things. And then he goes mad and say, are you angry at me? Mm-hmm. And starts to blame her mm-hmm. for him not doing something. Mm-hmm. Is that projection? I mean, it's a great example because that happens all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I can't think that quickly. Um, but I do know that that's a particular instance where both people would are angry probably and have to own their own anger. Mm. Um, what the other one did. It's mostly like um, when you project on to somebody else uh, a feeling of your Telling own. Telling them how they should feel. Yes. So I know. So like another thing, I can think of it mostly as a parent and all the projecting we all do onto our kids so unfairly. So it's like, are you sure you want to wear that outfit out? Um, that's projecting my fears, perhaps, on um, fear of judgment, my yeah. own judgment onto my children. Um, mm. I have uh, like parents that insist that their that their kids do certain things, like even go to college, right? Like we now know that you know college isn't for everyone. That there should be more in that there should be more um, a. Fr- affirmation of trades and um, people who are good with their hands and people who want to, you know, do all different things or, 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 or artistry. And so to say, you know, um, I don't think it's such a good idea that you become a plumber instead of going to a liberal arts college is a projection of the parents' own fears onto the kid. That's, mm. the, that's, that would be, I think, a good example. Mm. Right? Mm. And the last one I have for you is regression. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's when we go back to our childhood. We all know that feeling when we visit our parents as adults. <laughs> and we all <laughs> yeah. regress back into those childhood roles. So you could feel big and confident in life and then go home and be with a parent that put you down. And all of a sudden you're like, you know. Yeah. And you can easily just get back into that role without even noticing you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's been great. Jesus Christ. Over an hour. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, it's okay. It's been lovely chatting. I, hope this I is... just have uh, no, it's been great. I have two more questions, which is not work related, which sorry, okay. which is not podcast related. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so one of them is if you were to attend therapy, what would your idea therapist be like? Oh, somebody who is intelligent and well-read about various different ways of helping people because you don't want to fit, you don't want to make a person fit your model. Like if I do CBT, I'm going to look at, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, I may be working with people's thoughts, or if I'm a psychoanalysis, I may be a psychoanalyst, I may be looking for interpretations when what a person really needs is connection or... Mm. I may be wanting to work with emotions in the body when what somebody really wants to do is just vent. So I think you want someone that is attuned to your needs. One of the things I loved about ADP is it would say it's a collaborative endeavor versus some of these where the therapist was like on high deciding and judging. I didn't like that. I wanted Mm. like the idea of somebody that I'm, I'm collaborating with my therapist that they know more about different healing methods, but that they trust me that I am the expert on me. And that's Mm. what I say to my clients and patients. You're the expert on you. I am the expert on ways to feel better. It's a creative endeavor. And we're going to do this together. We're going to do this work together. I want someone who can tolerate feelings very, very well. And I always tell my patients, if I do anything to anger you or upset you or hurt your feelings, you must let me know because in AEDP, the, it's, it's so important to be authentic, right? Just to, to keep it real because we want people to go out there and be able to be their authentic selves. Mm. Therapy should translate. So I want someone, I pretty much want somebody that's really good at AEDP. <laughs> Okay, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite method because it encompasses a wide umbrella, but the stance of the therapist, I think, is very intelligent and, and very healing. Mm, mm. Yeah. I need and someone that can 
work with big emotions in the body and work with shame. Very important to have a therapist that understands shame and who can work with shame because shame, when you walk into a therapist's office, you feel ashamed. We're taught oh, that yeah. it's not okay to be Even, need yeah. so even making a help. phone call comes with a lot of shame. Exactly. So we need help <laughs> being able to um, notice when we feel ashamed, but then not let us not let that be the lens that we are living defensively through our shame and shame. I cannot mm. emphasize enough about the importance of understanding shame is the emotion, what its purpose is, when it's toxic, when it's in healthy amounts and how to heal from toxic shame. Mm. Mm. I, have, I have a few articles in my blog around that too. Yeah. 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 Um, my last question is what do you do for fun? Ah, uh, <laughs> when you're not I, writing blogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really love to hang out with my my husband, who's my best friend, and I love my children and my grandchildren, and um, and I love my friends. So uh, there's that, and um, I love to listen to music, and I love to watch funny, silly TV. <laughs> Junk and I TV. Love to walk outside and uh, you know and see nature, and I love cooking. Mm, yeah, very important skill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. That's a nice question. It's nice. Great. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a quick review on my Facebook page, Don't Be Afraid to Talk, or DM me on Instagram. The show notes will include all of the relevant links from today's episode. If you haven't already, please download, leave a rating, and share with your friends. You might just reach that person who needs to hear this message. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. I am James Lumumba, signing off with gratitude.